Thanks everybody for being here. This is workshop breakout session number 4A, climate solutions, supply chains, and over harvesting adaptations needed by farmers and fishers. My name's Justin, you've seen me a million times now. I'm the dad joke guy. Um, I'm also the chair with the Center for Local Prosperity and I'm the executive director of Farmers Markets in Nova Scotia. Uh, I was once involved in fisheries for many moons. Uh, I was a fishmonger and used to work at the Ecology Action Center where Simon works. Uh, and there's gonna be a decent amount of, of talk you know, around fisheries here tonight, but also around uh, adaptations for climate solutions. So I'm gonna just briefly overview the panel uh, and how we've described it, and then I'll introduce our speakers and we'll jump right into it. There are a multiplicity of pressures on food production, including our fisheries, because fish is also food. In addition to climate change, supply chain disruptions, over-harvesting, and over-development reduce the ability to produce and deliver local food within our region. Panelists will document successful and ongoing adaptations critical to our times. So, uh, I will quickly introduce the speakers and get them into uh, their, their respective 10 minute talks. We have Colleen Freak, who's with Farmers for Climate Solutions, uh, which is a Canada wide organization, but Colleen also farms in Nova Scotia. We have Simon Ryder Burbage from the Ecology Action Center uh, in Halifax. Kimberly Oren from Fishing for Success, based in Petty Harbor in the island of Newfoundland and Ken Paul from the Tobique First Nation in Willowstoke, or New Brunswick. So without further ado, I would love to get you to kick things off, Colleen. Thank you so much. Hello. I just wanted to take the temperature and see who's here today. Uh, is anyone, um, has anyone grown, raised, or harvested their own food? Who's here today? Just show of hands. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. And has anyone grown, raised, or harvested their food as a livelihood? So as a business? Oh, great. Or as an employee? Yeah. Wow. Awesome. So I wanted to, to um, talk to people who maybe don't have that background as well as those who do. So forgive me if this is uh, an overview of what you already know. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a farm worker, and I'm a farmer, and I live in West Hans um, on the Bay of Hundy. And um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, farming as a business. So uh, we all have to make ends meet in some way. And I wanted to bring you some facts about farming. According to the, the most recent StatsCan numbers, um, farmers' uh, net income is 40% from off-farm sources. So we're really hustling in order to make ends meet. Um, this, not to say anything about profitability, but just to talk about we're all working off farm, most of us. I think, uh, <laughs> not to talk too much about the National Farmers Union, uh, because I'm here with not that organization, but um, there's some really great information linking the farm income crisis to the climate crisis. So that information is out there. In the wake of Hurricane Fiona, I really think it's important that we talk about adaptation and mitigation for farms uh, in our region. Um, that was an expected event. We knew that was coming, and it was really expensive when it happened, and we could have been better prepared. So um, with, with that in mind, I think um, we can acknowledge that we're all vulnerable. Our food system is vulnerable, and farmers are most vulnerable. Uh, did anyone <laughs> who works outside have to work out, outside in the heat wave this summer when it was 40 degrees with the humidex? Yeah, it was unsafe, it felt really unsafe. So uh, we have some uh, what we're calling beneficial management practices known as BMPs. Please correct me if I say BMPs, but it's beneficial management practices that help um, adapt and mitigate climate change. So um, we're here to um, both reduce emissions and increase farm resilience using those beneficial management practices. Um, I needed to de define the problem a little bit, so I just wanted to talk about how greenhouse gas emissions are measured 
and uh, where they're coming from uh, in agriculture. So there's not a lot of consensus about how do we measure greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture because we have both sequestra sequ sequestration, sorry, and we also have emissions. So it, it becomes a pretty hot topic. So to clarify what we're talking about, um, uh, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture in Canada are measured um, in the National Inventory Report, which is a submission to the United Nations, um, the UNFCC, uh, basically tracking our, our emissions and our emissions reduction. So according to the recent National Inventory Report, agricultural emissions in Canada have risen to 8%. And the majority of that is coming from nitrogen fertilizer. It's the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. So it's complex. Uh, and I just want, for those who were at the topic table, that you all saw this graph, but just how complex are greenhouse gas emissions? They're pretty complex. So these are, this is a chart showing the, the sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but they are summarized uh, in the, the top two as cattle and nitrogen fertilizer. So that's from the National Farmers Union uh, report agricultural greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. So what works best and what are these beneficial management practices? Um, I think uh, I'd like to just talk a little bit about Farmers for Climate Solutions. So uh, we are a coalition, national coalition, of 24 farmer-led and farmer-supporting organizations across Canada. And the ones who are in our region that I know, and if you're a member, please raise your hand. Maybe, uh, maybe raise your hand if you're part of the coalition. Anyone know? Great. Thank you. So yeah, the National Farmers Union, New Brunswick, the Ecology Action Centre, Organic Nova Scotia, um, Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association, there's a few. Um, right, so the most recent report from Farmers for Climate Solutions uh, came out in time to influence uh, Canadian agricultural policy through the Agricultural Policy Framework, which is a five-year national um, framework that comes out that starts uh, April 2023 and runs to 2028. So that's a critical timing for policy to influence our emissions before the Paris Agreement. So we need to reduce emissions to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees. And uh, that's what this report is, is specifying. So what works best, um, Farmers for Climate Solutions um, determined was through the uh, um, cooperation of experts across the country to produce a report rooted in climate action. and. Uh, it's actually four reports, three technical reports, and one summary. So <laughs> I can't show you or tell you the whole report, but for those of you who have read it, when one of you I know has, um, I just brought the graph that shows how it's um, the summary of beneficial management practices, their cost, and the greenhouse gas emission reduction associated with each one. So this is a roadmap to reduce emissions by 14%. Um, and it's the most affordable, effective pathway that we have. So uh, the five broad categories, just for those of you who don't know already, are nitrogen management, manure, storage and handling, livestock management, soil management, wetland and tree management. So I'm not going to list them all. Um, there's 19. You can read about them. Um, so in agricultural policy, we focus on using the carrot, not the stick. So we're incentivizing climate-friendly farming, and um, we know that there's an income crisis and that farmers disproportionately um, have the burden uh, to change on farms. So we're adapting these broad recommendations that are national, where um, Farming is very different in different parts of Canada. So um, we're working in, in Nova Scotia. I know there's different efforts in different provinces to adapt the, those recommendations to how we farm here. So if anyone um, far is farming here, please um, come talk to me. Maybe you have an opinion, you want to collaborate. 
um, re I'm in the process of refining um, these recommendations for, for us. So in summary, uh, the climate crisis disproportionately affects farmers. Farmers need financial support to implement climate solutions. And we have a roadmap to reduce emissions. So uh, just one final note about my experience has been um, Farmers for Climate Solutions uh, has inspired me by being radically inclusive and looking at solutions holistically. And uh, I really hope that we can work together. So come talk to me. Thank you so much, Colleen. I'll pass the mic over to Simon now. Check. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Colleen. That was a great start. I'm um, going to move us into the ocean now. Um, my name is Simon. I'm with the Ecology Action Center in Halifax, and I'm the Marine Campaign Coordinator there. Um, shout out to Moore and Ben, who maybe some of you know, who, who do our, our, our food work. Um, but if you're interested in marine stuff, um, I have a couple of stories to tell today. Um, our marine program is centered around four key pillars, sustainable fisheries and aquaculture, sustainable seafood, marine protection and planning, and coastal livelihoods. And um, it's the coastal livelihoods piece that kind of ties together all of those themes and um, a couple of the tales I'm going to dig into today. Um, these are not fisheries stories. Uh, hopefully that's fine. Um, I just want to shout out at the beginning here, Justin, who used to work at the EAC, ran a very cool program called Off the Hook, which was one of Canada's first community-supported fisheries. Um, and the time for that kind of work is uh, really here again, I think. Um, I'm not going to dig into that today, but uh, I'll just encourage everyone to ask Justin about Off the Hook, which is a really cool program. Um, these two tales today are about growing. Um, Tons of growers in the room, which is great. So I'm, I'm now curious to know how many of you have uh, grown food or, or grown anything in an aquatic environment? Okay, a couple. A couple, that's great. Um, so for those of you who would like to try, uh, we're doing a couple of things to try to um, help coastal communities adapt to a lot of the changes we're seeing uh, at sea. Um, in some ways, I felt kind of challenged by the impetus to focus on solutions uh, here because we're at such a like nascent uh, larval stage around understanding the scope of the problems um, at sea right now related to climate change and how that affects fisheries and coastal communities and, and um, in, in growing ways, aquaculture as well. Um, but two things we're trying here today. Um, the first is called Kelp Curious. Um, have, have you ever felt kelp curious? Uh, if you have, this, this, this is for you. Um, basically what we're doing is we're setting up a uh, combination of an educational center and a business incubator hub with a partner uh, named Peter Darnell, who's a mussel farmer down in Mahone Bay. Um, we've got, we're in year two of the project now, we've got um, a nursery set up in Peter's old mussel processing plant. Uh, it's really basic, like DIY, uh, MacGyver style stuff couple of aquarium tanks, chillers, tubes, um, cheap UV lights. Um, and we've got kelp growing on um, twine and spool right now down there, uh, sugar kelp and uh, horsetail kelp, um, which are both local to uh, Nova Scotian waters. Um, kelp is a big deal these days. Uh, it's, there's a huge buzz around seaweed in general um, and what it can do for, uh, you know, both both climate adaptation, but also um, you know, organic, uh, organic and basically biodegradable product markets. Everything from biofuels to bioplastics to the stuff that ends up in your toothpaste and your ice cream, carrageenan, um, and food sources as, as well. Um, seaweed can do all of that, and we're learning a lot more. Um, so our role is to try to figure out what does this mean for um, small-scale growers in coastal communities in Mi'kma'ki, Nova Scotia, um, and where do, uh, where do those folks fit into that picture? Uh, a big question we want to answer um, through the work we're doing at Kelp Curious is what are we going to do with all this kelp that people are proposing to grow? Um, for, the big, for the big markets and where the big money's at, um, you know, offshore, huge offshore kelp farms um, are basically going to be the source of these like biofuels and bioplastics markets. This is this big tech energy, like innovation stuff, big capitalist dollars. Um, so we're trying to make a space for something completely different at the small scale. 
um, and finding, uh, helping growers to kind of take uh, all the steps that they need to take from um, their first question about what is kelp and what does it do, all the way to actually selling um, kelp that they've grown in a lease that's close to where they live um, to hopefully a local buyer. Um, so everything from product uh, development to market development to um, actual educational seminars and training workshops for growers, um, public education seminars at the plant, and then um, all kinds of research that we're hoping to enable at the lease site. We have an experimental um, arrangement where we're encouraging researchers to come in and if they want to look at carbon sequestration or if they want to look at biochemistry or if they want to look at um, different methods of growing, they can do that. Um, and hopefully at the end of the day, we're going to make a space for people to come in and uh, just figure out whether kelp and seaweed might be a fit for them as they try to pull together, um, you know, if, if they're interested in pulling together a kind of patchwork livelihood. I think to Colleen's point, 40% um, off farm income, if that's the number, I mean, this is a great option for, for seasonal workers um, right now because most of the kelp growing happens between October and April. Um, so it, it can be winter work, and once you get it in the water around you know, Christmas time, it's pretty low maintenance after that, which is great, and you can sell in April. Um, so that's number one, kelp curious. Uh, I'm going to move to the second um, aquatic green at this time, um, eelgrass. We have a second project called Eelgrass for Everyone. Um, you could rename this talk, I guess, like poorly known marine greens. Um, <laughs> Eelgrass is another thing that's getting more and more attention these days. It's, it's been kind of an understudied habitat for much of, uh, much of the history of at least like the kind of Western um, science that, a lot of, that the government runs. Um, what we're trying to figure out, how much eelgrass uh, is there in Nova Scotia, in Mi'kma'ki? How much uh, have we lost? Um, and what are our chances to help to restore some of those ecosystems? Eelgrass is great for um, fish nursery, so uh, it supports larval, the larval stages of a lot of the commercial fish that we really rely on in coastal communities. Um, and also it's known as one of the best uh, carbon sequestering marine habitats um, and can cover in some cases like quite a bit of ground. Um, so it's, it's really like, uh, it's just a great ecosystem. It's something that we want to know more about, we want to support. Um, so we've kind of uh, worked up a citizen science program where we're, we're asking uh, kayakers or people who are interested in knowing, to get, getting to know these marine met, um, eelgrass meadows to strap GoPros onto the bottom of their kayak and do these little transects in the bays that they know and love um, and basically record data and figure out how much eelgrass is in a, in a particular location, um, how much is being lost year over year and uh, what, are the, what are the drivers of that loss. Um, so that's been kind of one aspect of the project. And then another one is just like your basic ops, coastal observations. So we, we've, we've got an iNaturalist project going now. For anyone who does not know iNaturalist, you take a picture of a, kind of any organism that you might find out there in the world, um, and it will help you to ID this, this species. Um, and we've now got more than 700 observations um, of eelgrass all around the Maritimes. Um, by more than 60 people, which is excellent. Um, and that is helping us to build a map of all the eelgrass um, around the province um, so that we can do some, some research and use that data in ways that can help us to restore that species. Um, the final part of that project is the actual restoration aspect, and this is the growing part. Uh, we have very little, there's a lot, again, there's a lot of buzz about restoring these ecosystems, but we have very little knowledge about how to actually to do that. Um, what we're trying, very simple, um, snorkelers, burlap sacks, um, eelgrass seeds collected from mature meadows that are ready to spawn, um, and basically just stuffed into a burlap sack and then kind of gently pushed down into the sediment in coastal areas and sandy, muddy bottoms where eelgrass likes to grow. And the second method uh, is like a suspended culture system where we kind of we, we collect or we encourage um, volunteers to collect eelgrass that's washed up on shore um, that has seeds attached to it. Uh, that goes into, again, a kind of porous bag that just hangs on a hook, kind of. This would be easier with a picture. Um, hangs on a hook in the water column, and then when the seeds mature, they just kind of fall off of the eelgrass shoots and ideally spread and settle um, on the bottom. 
in a location where we think eelgrass restoration is feasible. Um, so that, and you know, there's lots of science to go with that too. We're also starting to do some carbon, uh, blue carbon coring to figure out um, how much carbon eelgrass meadows actually do sequester and um, in, in cases where they've been lost or, or where we're making uh, efforts to restore them, what do those restoration efforts actually produce in terms of carbon sequestration? Because that is really at this point completely unknown. Um, again, a lot of buzz and energy and money um, being invested in, in climate adaptation, restoration, what we call nature-based climate solutions. Um, that's kind of government speak, I guess. Uh, but we don't really know to what extent restoration efforts are going to produce the climate um, adaptation or sequestration results that are currently promised. Um, that is a, an, an ongoing question that we're trying to help answer. Um, so yeah, if, you know, if, if folks are interested or if you know folks who live in coastal communities who are growers, who are uh, keen on kelp or eelgrass or just wanting to get to know their local marine communities better, um, we do have a couple of programs that uh, we want to get people involved in. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd love, to, we'd love to hear from folks. So I'll leave it there and thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> Next up we have, yep, it should be hot. And we have Kimberly up here. Okay, good morning. Um, every time I come to speak to folks, I always switch up what I'm gonna say at the last minute. So I don't know, here goes. So I think what I'll do is uh, first, just of course, read you the spiel, uh, the official thing about what Fishing for Success is. It's a community-based nonprofit social enterprise museum that works to transmit the intangible cultural heritage of Newfoundland and Labrador's family fishery. We advocate for an inclusive, gender equitable, and sustainable small-scale fishery that can help combat climate change and contribute to food sovereignty through better local seafood access. We provide free or reduced cost programming for women, children, youth, newcomers, and indigenous community members by partnering with other like-minded nonprofits. We generate revenue by offering unique visitor, special occasion, and conference offerings. So, I started as a high school science teacher, and I taught chemistry and physics and all of those kinds of things, but I always took my students outside, and I began to notice over the years that the young people didn't know the names of the plants and animals in their own backyard, and that concerned me. And of course, I was teaching in the 80s and the 90s and the early aughts, and uh, that was when the um, virtual screens were becoming smaller and smaller, and then kids could put them in their back pocket. And as they became more attached to these things and less attached to outside, you know, I saw other changes and behavior changes in the classroom. And you know, I was concerned about, um, I knew how I got attached to science, and that was outside hanging around the wharf, hauling out fish guts and talking to fishermen and the women who were cleaning the fish and asking about, is this a boy fish or a girl fish? Where'd this fish come from? What kind of fish is it? And that's how I got interested in science. And I didn't want the kids to grow up to all be coders or game designers. Or I wanted them to get to the ocean and help us solve this big crisis of climate change because I knew that's where it was at. And this world is covered 70% by water. So I decided to quit teaching and um, start a nonprofit to teach kids to fish because I wanted to throw as many kids at the problem as, as possible. And uh, so I felt that in order to uh, tackle this climate crisis, what we needed to do was engage everyone, and that meant young people especially. And um, so I, I chose the place in Petty Harbor, and it occupies uh, land in Odahumkuk. And when you occupy land, you have a responsibility to get everybody in the boat. And uh, so I'm cheating a little bit. I brought some pictures. So here's a, a picture of one of our fishing sheds there. And you see a traditional boat that's painted in the colors of pride and trans inside and wrapped in brown and black. And so this is a visual representation of, uh, you know, one of our principal guiding to get everybody in the boat and make room for everyone. Because when we left people out of decision making, we harmed others and we harmed the land and the places that we depend upon and, and that we love. And so we, we can't do that anymore. I chose Petty Harbor because its uh, fishing families have done something amazing, which is to protect what they call a protected fishing area, which is a hand line only, a hook and line only fishery for cod. So throughout the years, they've done this, and it's still on the Canada Fisheries Act, a hook and line only fishery for cod. 
you handle the fish one at a time, you can very quickly and humanely kill it, and uh, you're not leaving gear in the water overnight, you're not using uh, gill nets that can break loose and contribute to microplastics, entanglements, ghost gear, all of those things that we know are harming the ocean. And, um, and, and, and it started really as a social program because the fishermen and fishing families recognized that a few wealthy fishermen could buy enough gill nets and block up the fishing grounds and the poorer fishermen with their hand lines wouldn't be able to provide for their families. So this was a place that I felt had a very good story that needed to be part of um, the mission of Fishing for Success moving forward. How to care for our oceans, how to treat the fish that do feel pain uh, hu in a humane way when they're providing food for people. And that's also an important story to tell young people who are so used to going through a drive through at McDonald's and not understanding that humans are predators and that we are killing animals uh, when we eat. And whether we're um, eating lettuce and killing an animal because we've plowed a field and we're displacing animals that depended on that ecosystem was, that was there, or if we're killing an animal directly because we're eating the flesh of the animals. So humanely, humane treatment of animals is very important. Um, also, um, you know, I, I, it's just going to be tough to say to this crowd now because I'm in a f room full of um, farmers, but fishing predates farming. And uh, all we have to do to look at uh, that evidence is look at some of the language that's used in our religions. So if you look at uh, casting a net and fishers of men and first fish for first people, or even in Islam, there's the story of the fish that holds up the world. And so fishing is a shared human heritage. I felt that it would be a way to draw young people together towards this uh, shared not only human heritage, but also a shared crisis that all of us have to work towards um, this change that's needed to um, yeah, stop climate crisis. And I don't, I don't know where that's going to go, but we definitely need to work towards that. So, um, so what have we done? When you get into teaching kids to fish, you realize there's a hell of a lot of inequities in fishing. It's male-dominated, so that in itself is a problem. So we've started programs like Girls Who Fish. You realize that there's other issues besides gender inequity. Uh, there's also racial issues. So you start programs with your fellow nonprofits to provide access to nature because it's intersectional. It's not just uh, gender. It's also you know, racialized, and it's newcomer, and it's urban indigenous who don't have access to their traditional food ways. And so we work to get um, access and make space for everyone that we can. Um, when our Girls Who Fish program has gone to Japan, they've been um, recognized for providing access to newcomers and their uh, children to access to fishing in a program called WISH, which was recognized as a promising practice by Cam H. We know that nature um, has nature healing, and so blue nature uh, even more so again. Um, let's see, I'm just going to check my notes here. Make sure I get it before I barrel through. Um, <laughs> and we are developing a C to school program, of course, to connect with curriculum so that we can uh, meet those science outcomes and targets that young people need to meet. And of course, um, let's see, language. Oh, yeah, so you know, we've got commercial fishing and we've got recreational fishing, but one of the things that um, I'm not going to do is I'm not going to teach a child that's a recreation to teach to kill a fish. So we need to change the language and encourage a policy change about the language of fishing because uh, there needs to be subsistence fishing, food fishing, and what does it look like to um, discuss that because it's not a recreation, it's a food, it's a gifting of um, you know, Mother Nature's providing for us, we are predators, and all of that. But to uh, wrap it up, uh, we need to think about there's no succession plan. It's very parallel to farming. Uh, fish harvesters are approaching the average age of 60. There's no plan for that. And um, also, um, developing a local food system is a national security issue. You know, if we're depending on food, you walk through Costco and you see food that's coming from Brazil and South America and South Africa, and, and if you think about uh, increasing climate change issues that are going to drive political challenges and uh, more storms that are going to shut these global supply chains down. Uh, we we're going to yeah we need to 
booster that local supply chain. And if you've been to Newfoundland and Labrador, you can see that we don't have a lot of soil. Where's our young farmer who was talking about his shovels and all of the gear he was using trying to make some soil in his backyard? Uh, Newfoundland and Labrador is not necessarily going to be the farmland of the future. And we look to the sea to provide nourishment. And so that's going to be a very different uh, thing for us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Last but not least, we have Ken. Zaglikap Wood Muen, Naga Nujiao, Lestuki, Nagutkuk. So my name is Ken Paul. I come from a First Nation in New Brunswick called Tobik. Um, it's located up in the northern corner. Um, our Willistuki, we're like sister nations to the Mi'kmaq. Um, I'm doing some work here with Millbrook First Nation in their fisheries aspect, and Jonathan asked me to come and speak on behalf of the community to present to the group. Um, so I'm a treaty beneficiary from the Peace and Friendship Treaties from 1725 to 1790, the Covenant Chain of Treaties, and I just wanted to do a scan and like, is who is anybody else here treaty beneficiaries? Okay, so um, anybody here Canadian? Put your hand. Okay, so that's a failure of your education system because treaties are agreements between nations. Treaties are not just about the Indians, okay? So recognized as a nation, and in fact, the treaties, so the famous one that we know about here, the Treaty of 1760, was upheld by Canada's Supreme Court under the Marshall decision in 1999. Um, these are pre-Confederation. So the treaty relationship between Mi'kmaq is with the Crown. And without that relationship, Canada would not exist in the form it is. Um, Abra yesterday mentioned, sorry, right here, um, Terra Nullius, that concept, and like there was the Pope came to visit in the spring, and that became to the forefront about, you know, this is empty land, so therefore take what you want. Well, that actually is something that we are trying to get uh, nullified because of, we have King Charles III now, and we're hoping that that's going to be something that we can do with our First Nations in Canada to get that nullified because that actually is uh, the basis of the Canadian Constitution, that this is empty land. So there's, you know, a question of the legitimacy of Canada and Canada's authority. Now, the reason why this is important is because we have this relationship. Now, um, you mentioned yesterday about uh, how patient Native people are and, you know, how resilient and, you know, why, didn't, why don't, you know, I don't, you don't understand why they don't just get people, everybody else out of here and go home. And, you know, when you first said that, the first question was, hmm, we can do that? <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing that actually came to mind was um, Albert Marshall, who's a friend of mine, he has told me once, he said that, you know, we've been neighbors for 500 years, but we still don't know each other. And I got to say, yesterday, um, I felt really awkward being here because nobody came up to talk to me. And I know there's a, f a few brave people did, you know, it was fine. But, and, and you know, one of the questions that you received was like, how do I get uh, Mi'kmaq to come to my farm? It's like, well, if you guys can't talk to me, an invitee to your conference and a speaker, like how are you gonna get along with the communities, right? Like that's, I just, I just found that a little bit puzzling. Anyway, let's talk about fish, all right? So in Canada, um, well, indigenous peoples in general have inherent rights. That's the basis of our rights, the United Nations Rights of the United Nations Declaration on the, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP, outlines all of these things. And Canada is a signatory as well as, I think it was 170 countries, including the United States, Australia, New Zealand, etc. And that inherent rights is our birthrights from here. So Mi'kmaq, like their ancestors came from here. They, they're literally, their blood runs through these soils. And all of their human remains, you know, gets recycled or composted through like worms and worms get eaten by birds and by fish and then you know that feeds the food food chain so their DNA is literally within the soils where we are actually standing. Now treaties actually don't give rights either. 
But what treaties do is they recognize existing inherent rights. They identify some of them. So guaranteed in these treaty rights from this region, which includes my nation, is um, the right to hunt, fish, and gather. In all of the treaties across Canada, whether they're pre-Confederation, which are the Peace and Friendship Treaties, the uh, Robson-Huron and Robson-Superior Treaties in Ontario, the Douglas Treaties in, uh, in uh, BC, they are all pre-Confederation. The number of treaties across uh, the prairies, um, they're with Canada. But in every single one of those treaties, they talk about fishing. This is why it's so deeply and deep and contentious within our communities. We, we, we know that this goes into our rights. Um, another little anecdote I'll tell you, like I was, um, I was at a negotiation table a year and a half ago when all this stuff happened with the residential schools, the, the first discovery, recovery, um, of the 215 children up in Kamloops, you know, that happened and somehow this struck a chord with Canadians. And I, I'm not really sure why this and not anything else, because we have survivors from residential schools that have, have been in this, in this room in these last two days, right? But for whatever reason, I, you know, I, I was in a fisheries negotiation and a person from Canada, a representative of Canada said, okay, before we start, I just want to acknowledge, you know, the pain and the suffering that your communities have gone through because of the residential school system and how much it is a recovery and that we know, just know that we as Canadians feel this. And I, you know, it kind of took me by surprise because I thought, we're going to talk about fish, right? So I, I, there was a pause for about 15 seconds, and, and then I said, well, okay, I, I acknowledge that. Thank you for that. I understand that people are now just starting to realize the horrors, and that's, for whatever reason, this is happening. But I just want you to know that you, that residential schools thing isn't something that happened over here, and now we're going to talk about fish. That was part of a concentrated effort, a strategy to separate kids from the communities, put Native people on small little reserves, impose the Indian Act, which is still a live document. So, you know, according to Canada, I'm a ward of the state because I'm a status card carrying Indian. Um, and you can say First Nations and Aboriginal and whatever you want, but under Canadian law, I'm an Indian because that's what it says in the Constitution there's an Indian Act. So if you wonder if Canada's, you know, has a systemically racist system, I don't think there's any other... There's no Caucasian Act. There's no Frank, you know, Francophonia Act. It's all about managing the Indians. So um, I had to draw the parallels that all of these different things that happen are all about controlling Native people, so getting us out of the way, so that the resources can be exploited. All right. So just just know just know that that's the context that we are dealing with people, and also a lot of the people from our communities. Um, and when we go up these gathering meetings, if we had a meeting like this, there would be you know, lots of very emotional and, um, you know, impassioned, I will say speeches, um, but that comes from intergenerational trauma. And so this is the kind of things that we have to deal with. Yeah, okay. So, back to fish. <laughs> um, the problem that we're having with our fisheries is even though we have wins in Canada's Supreme Court, with respect to food cer social ceremonial fishery, that's the Sparrow decision from 1990, moderate livelihood, which actually upheld one of the treaties, um, which happened here in 1999. Well, here we are in 2023, and neither of those Supreme Court of Canada decisions have been implemented by Canada. And I know there's a separation between the executive branch, the judi judicial branch, and the uh, legislative branch. If there's a court case that goes against First Nations, immediately. It's, it's the next day that it is implemented. So we're having all of these problems. Um, what's happening in our fisheries is that now our communities are running under DFO licenses. It, this was a temporary measure. It was only supposed to be three years. Well, you know, it's been 20, 22 years now, these interim measures. And that provides own source revenue, so we're not going to, you know, touch that. But what Sebag and Equity forced Canada to do, they said, look, Canada has just assumed control over the fisheries. They assume that they have the authority. They actually don't. And when Sebag and Agatee, and the only thing, according to the court cases, that can, can supersede or um, justify an infringement on rights is if there's a threat to conservation. So Sebag and Agatee said, well, we have scientists. We are going to go out and we're going to go fish. And um, you know, we're going to put 1,000 traps in the water. Well, <laughs> the department came in and Nobody was arrested from 
from the Mi'kmaq, but all of the gear was taken. And this is the cycle that happens every year. Our members go out, they put gear in the water, DFO literally will come by five minutes later, pull the gear out. And our members are in little open boats. DFO has the, you know, the force of the Canadian state. The department's like mismanaging the fisheries. Right now, lobster's in a boom. That's great. Warming waters are coming in this area. Well, what's gonna happen to lobster larvae in 10 years? And then what's gonna happen to all these big investments in these coastal fisheries? So what we are trying to do is not only take advantage of the fisheries things, but we also are trying to get recognition and support to actually um, develop our own science met methodologies and develop our own seasons and do our own monitoring so that we can actually take care of these lands which was left to us by our ancestors. We don't have support for that. We, and as a matter of fact, if somebody tries to work with us, Canada will, or the province, will punish those people. So for example, Sabaganagadi caught a bunch of lobster, some of the other communities are doing that. When they go to sell to a buyer, that provincial buyer Who's, um, that buyer who's registered through the province ha has a stipulation that says you can only buy from a registered, registered um, fishery or otherwise you'll lose your license. So buyers can't buy from us. And um, that it's not that what we're doing is legal, it's just it's in this political gray zone where it's not you know, recognized by the courts so therefore the default is to close us down. We want to develop indigenous knowledge our own science systems with a, with a two-eyed seeing approach, which is what Albert and Mardina and Marshall, Albert's uh, late wife, had developed for us, so that we can actually bring in our value system within the way that we approach our fisheries. So indigenous knowledge, is, in knowledge isn't just what you know. There's a whole value system in there. An example of this is, um, like I've been into a lot of like advisory meetings for fisheries, where you have native fishers and non-native fishers. The non-native fishers will argue with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans as saying that, you know, I know your scientists said this is the total allowable catch and you got your confidence interval, but our, our guys are out there in the water, we see different things, you guys didn't do surveys at the right time of year, you know, we think you should bump up the TAC, the quota. Well, our native fishers will say, well, I don't really understand the science of what you did in your surveys, but if that's the bottom end of the confidence interval, we, we think you should do that instead because we want to make sure that there's fish for next year. And it's that, now they call it a precautionary approach, but that to us makes common sense. It's not just about maximizing economic efforts. So what we do need is the supports, because we do have talented people, we have people that are out in the water, there you know, a lot of the people who live in coastal areas as well. Um, and this is the innovation, I guess, <laughs> coming back to the theme that I wanted to talk about. And if there's any ways that anybody here can actually support that, that would be really appreciated because when indigenous communities thrive, all the other surrounding communities reap the benefits as well. So I just wanted to point that out. Right. Thank you very much, Ken. And thank you to all the panelists. We now have uh, just over 10 minutes, so we're going to turn it over to everybody here for questions. And we have a mic runner who will run a mic to you. Any questions from the crowd for our panelists? We got one right up here in the front. Oh, now it's on. Hi, Ken. Um, it, one of the um, concerns or arguments ag against um, the Mi'kmaq fisheries approach that I've heard. Um, that I would just love to hear, you know, what you say in response to it, um, is is about uh, fishing when the lobster are not as big, or or um, yeah, like not actually fishing in a way that is going to reap the maximum economic benefit um, because of, um, as I understand it, uh, fishing in small boats. Uh, you know, you don't you don't want to be out. Um, as far and in the worst weather, which is when the Canadian regulated fishery tends to happen. Um, and, and I guess I, I would just love, I, I would just like to hear what you, a little bit more about what you say about that. Like what, what is, 
uh, the rationale and, and maybe an argument uh, for a different approach that is not um, seeking that cold water, maximum hard shell, et cetera, uh, lobster. Um, yeah, that's that, these are arguments that come through. You see them in the media. You see them through Facebook and stuff like that. Like, and um, you know, you should see the thing season for a reason. Well, the, season, the reason for lobster season, especially in Area 34 off Yarmouth, is because of the hard shell. That's where you can make the maximum gain is if you had hard shell lobster, which means you fish between November and May. Well, the Department of Fisheries, which is supposed to be the science authority as well, has no data on lobster between May and November because they're only relying on the reports from the commercial catch and they only look at it in tonnage. Sebag and Agaty, I mean, I'm just going to talk about Shuby because they, they were the ones that sort of you know, brought this to the forefront and the other communities are doing different things. But they, they actually hired a lo uh, their own um, scientist from Dalhousie University, a friend of mine, and um, they said, we're gonna do a spring fishery. Um, in the winter time, there's a million traps in the water, right? So that's not a quota, right? That's not a biomass, that's effort. So Baganagany was gonna put a thousand traps in the water in the summer, but then DFO, told them, no, you can't do that because the science doesn't support it. I said, well, where's the science? And I says, well, it's going to be soft shell. And, it's, and one of the negotiators told me, like, well, you know, Mi'kmaq could catch seven times more lobster in the summer because it's warmer waters and water, lobsters are coming into shallow water. Assuming that Mi'kmaq are going to exploit, you know, like, but th that's just not within the DNA. They're not going to do that. And in fact, the, the fishing regulations that they've made for their bands, they actually made the carapace size two millimeters bigger, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and if there's molting lobsters, then, you know, they're not gonna take them. And then we started to point out the fact that just across the imaginary dotted line between Maine and, and Nova Scotia, they fish 12 months a year in Maine. But somehow our lobsters can't with hold that, our lobsters, right? So these are the kind of things that, that we're, we're trying to make people understand, but the department won't bend because the, the tenant within the Department of Fisheries and Oceans is that you can't fetter the minister's authority. But our, our thing is like, well, show us like where uh, Mi'kmaq have given up rights to and sign the stuff over. So this is, this is the things that we're trying to deal with and it's painful. It's painful, but you know we have to persevere and we have to make sure that we do our own work and develop our own like watering plans, management plans for the water and the marine environment and all these other things because it's about our food security. It's not just commercial catch. You know we we have to eat off that. We, we have the highest rate of you know uh, of welfare and all kinds of other negative things that happen because of that health issues, um, imprisonment, and things like that because we don't have access to the the bounty that's here. We're Everybody else is making literally millions and millions of dollars, but somehow Mi'kmaq are the, are the issue. So anyway, this is just from what I see, right? Thank you, Ken. Any other questions from the audience? I see one question right here in the middle. Uh, I have uh, two questions, so I'll, I'll ask them both. Um, uh, my first question was about the eelgrass. Um, I don't know anything about eelgrass, um, but it sounded like a lot of the eelgrass areas are sort of like the, um, uh, the, the southern coast of Nova Scotia, uh, if that's correct. Um, I live on the Bay of Fundy, where obviously we have the highest tides in the world, and, and it's an area that has a very different um, uh, shoreline, and I was just curious if eelgrass grows in those like extreme intertidal areas, or if it's just sort of the the more um, coastal, you know, Mahone Bay, uh, rocky sort of typical areas. Um, and then just my second question, if I can throw it out really quickly, uh, is more a comment to Ken. Uh, I was the person actually yesterday who said like, hey, I own a farm and I, I live in Nova Scotia and I have no idea how to connect with Indigenous communities. Um, so after this, I would love to talk to you because I, it's really not about inviting people to my farm. It's about how do I make those initial connections when, I, when, when I, they currently don't exist in my life. So I would love to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> uh, well, to the first, to the first question, um, I don't know the like extreme extent of like eelgrass habitat. Um, the person who runs that program is a proper eelgrass scientist, so I can certainly get an answer for you. Um, most of our work has focused on the Scotian shelf, 
so far. So like the, that's like kind of between, you know, Eastern Cape Breton and like say Shelburne. Um, so that's where we have most of our observations and where we know mo the most about like eelgrass habitat around that, you know, the, the study area. Um, we're looking for more people to, uh, who are interested in this, like on the Bay of Fundy side to try to learn more about like what eelgrass looks like on, on, on the Fundy side. Um, my family, uh, is largely PEI based. And so like we have, you know, kind of not as intense tidal ecosystem there, but certainly, uh, decently tidal ecosystem on the Northumberland Strait. And, um, there are very healthy eelgrass meadows there. And we're working with some watershed groups in the Gulf to, um, do some research in that neck of the woods. So Fundy kind of represents the last like uh, understudied area for the program that we're running. So um, maybe we can connect more on that um, yeah, afterwards. I would like to add something to the couple of you. Even though you haven't asked, but anyway. I do wanna bring up a couple of things in regards to um, vessel size. And then also uh, some of the things that Ken was addressing as far as um, when the animals could be fished or harvested. And, um, you know, DFO does their best to do great science, but they're not there in the communities all the time <coughs> observing what the animals are doing. And, um, and then also, uh, so they're not aware of, you know, changes in the animal's movement. And that issue is going to become um, even more of a problem as... Um, our ecosystems change in response to climate change. So if we don't, if we don't have a system that is listening to um, uh, fishermen and women in C2 right there, and they're saying, oh, the fish behavior has changed, we need to change when we can fish, we need to fish when they're there, uh, and we don't have a system that responds quickly, we're gonna be in trouble, just as Farmers need to plant when they can plant and then harvest when it's ready. Right now, people can't fish that way. They have very, you can do it then and do it then and you have to take up your gear by midnight and it it's causes a lot of dangerous problems. So, and, and it causes problems about whether or not you actually get any fish. So that's one thing. The other thing I wanted to bring up too is about vessel size. It's actually um, better for the climate for us to use smaller vessels. Now, we, that does mean we have to balance safety with it. And so then that goes back to the issue of being able to fish when the fish are there and being able to fish when the weather's good and not having to fit into this very, you have a one week time to go get halibut and that's it. Not the day before, not the day after. And so really working these two things together is very important because there's a lot of research out and very happy to share this with you. Um, about how uh, vessel size, smaller vessels closer to shore is, is safer um, and it's not, and, and it's, uh, you know, you use less fuel and so that's better for, for the climate. So, um, so it's something that we all need to open the conversation for. Thanks so much. We got one question over here in the middle and that might take us to the end unless we all want to be rebellious and go for a little bit longer. Thank you. <laughs> We are the rebels, are we? Um, I just wanted to say first, thank you all, because those were all very enlightening points of view. Thank you. And just going back to Colleen's uh, talk, I just wanted to mention, I'm with Perennia Food and Agriculture, and I, I'm pretty sure you're probably aware of this, Colleen, but I just want to throw it out there. Um, my colleagues at Perennia that are ag specialists um, are running a program from the federal government right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's called OFCAF. Um, on farm climate action, and it's focused on three mitigation um, and I guess uh, climate uh, climate change uh, action items: nitrogen management, cover cropping, and rotational grazing. So, if anybody wanted to apply for that, the application deadline for this round is November thirtieth, and it's there's funding and training available up to seventy five percent. So. Just making you aware. I think you can find more info on the Perini website. Off CAF is the name of the program. Thank you. Okay, thanks. We're going to sneak in one more question over here at the end. And I believe our mic runner also has a question. Okay. <laughs> Which is awesome. Because our mic runner is also a friend. Um, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I'm just wondering whether you see kind of any hope or potential solutions for. 
uh, climate change in fisheries or for indigenous food systems with the Canadian National Advisory Food Council. Uh, personally, I, um, I believe in optimism and hope. That's, that's what I work for. <laughs> um, I don't know about the National Food Council. Honestly, I, I don't think that, that any of these national organizations are really that effective because they're removed. And really what the power has to be is in with local communities and coastal native communities because they're the ones that are managing the resources, but they have to be empowered. And um, area management is, is very important in the marine sector. Um, understanding cumulative effects, which seems federal departments, provincial departments seem to have a hard time getting a hold of that because they say, oh, that's not my jurisdiction, that's your jurisdiction, right? They, these departments don't necessarily talk to each other. They're literally divisions <laughs> within these departments. Um, but, uh, and also, like, like, like I'm not going to solve climate change, but in the area that I can work, I'm hoping that we can empower local groups, and I feel as though if everybody, coastal communities, uh, could actually manage their parts, then this it's kind of like a quilt brought together that will help to mitigate the entire problem. That's the way I try to think about it. I would like to, um, for people to think about expanding what we eat. You know, I think, you know, what we eat is cultural, and. I know some of the shishi folks who do this gathering stuff, and you know they've kind of expanded a little bit because it's the hot, sexy thing now. But you know, they're like we fishermen talk about. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> talk about trash fish. Really, is any fish trash? So you know, thinking about um, eating fish that we wouldn't normally eat, and uh, so I'd really like to open the discussion about that and um, in, in proving that because no fish is trash. Mm. They're they're all special. And we'll get the last question to the person who's working the hardest. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I am a farmer, but uh, this is actually a question for the fishery people. Um, it's kind of tangential. Um, but I know that invasive species uh, are especially a large problem in our marine ecosystems uh, for destroying habitats. And we were talking a lot about foraging yesterday um, and things like that. Do you think there's opportunity for markets for invasive things like green crabs and tunicates in Nova Scotia? Because I know we have them elsewhere, but people aren't really open to eating these things here. Well, so that's sort of what I was touching on for a moment. You know, it's like eating periwinkles or um, sea cucumbers and, you know, expanding uh, what we eat. If you know, if you travel, when if you have the opportunity to travel around you, the world, you see that different cultures eat different things. So the foods that we eat, you know, are cultural. Um, you know, there are people in places that eat insects, and so that's been something that's brought up that we should think about eating insects in order to reduce our impact on climate change. And um, I've eaten some insects. You know, they're pretty good, covered in chocolate, and. Um, <laughs> Ants are good without chocolate, but um, yeah, so I do. We, we need to look at all of that. Right now, Fishing for Success has a graduate student who's working with us, and she's um, uh, studying sea cucumbers in, in the north and helping to develop a sustainable fishery on that. So yeah, definitely a possibility on all of those. Do you have? Uh, yeah, I can just say something about green crab, I guess, because that's one of the main... Um, uh, destroyers of eelgrass habitat, and um, there is uh, very much a potential market for it. Um, I think one of the biggest issues right now is that um, the federal government is uh, trying to establish a commercial licensing system for green crab trapping, um, even though it is like a widespread and highly invasive species that's destroying existing ecosystems right now. So um, that's uh, an issue that I think uh, a lot of folks are working on. It's not my area of expertise, but um, definitely uh, there are places uh, where you can leave a trap in the water, I understand, and, and uh, you know, for, for a day, and there's 70 green crabs there. Um, and it can be used as bait. Uh, it can be used as uh, bait for various fisheries. Um, so you know, there, there are uses for it. Um, it's not like a widespread thing yet, but hopefully we can find ways to open up access to uh, you know, yeah, fisher, uh, fisheries like green crab. Right, I think we're gonna wind it down there just for the sake of time. I will suggest that everybody look on Google for the recipe for green crab fritters. 
and do the eelgrass a favor while having a tasty treat. Um, on behalf of the entire conference planning committee, I just want to thank these experts for taking the time to be here and for you to, to come here and ask your questions. Uh, don't miss your chance to network in real time with these folks before the conference winds down today. So thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate it.